Uh, so um, hands up everyone who has done the prerequisites and the little tests and it all works. Okay, that is about half of you. So hands up everyone who has not just put their hand up. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys five minutes, but no more, to catch up with this stuff. Any more than that is really unfair on the people who have done the preparation. Don't worry, uh, if you haven't done the prerequisites, I'm going to propose that you sit and pair up with the person sitting next to you or someone who does have the stuff. Um, and you've got the handout, you can get an early release copy of my book, the full tutorial is online, so you will be able to do all of this stuff in your own time later. Do, 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 do. If you are trying to install Django and Selenium in a mad rush, and you're finding that PyPI is slow or broken due to HTTPS issues, I have it on a USB key for you here, so hands up if you need a USB key. <laughs> Hmm? Let's just hit eject over here. Book. <coughs> Who had to come far today? I had to come from London. That's an 11 hour flight. Um, loads of fun, of course. Anybody topping that? Ah, ah. Where did you come from, sir? No. Oh, you're fine then. <laughs> Have you got over the jet lag yet? Or uh, no, it's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take a look at part zero of your handout. It's got a couple of tests couple of little commands you can run there which will check that you've actually got the right Django and the right Selenium and the right Firefox and the right Git all installed. Hmm? Which one? Oh yeah, well, don't see. Maybe it's just a wrapping issue. Where is my handout? I haven't got it. Well, I've got it on a PDF. I'll be alright. <laughs> oh well, the start project delete me, so that's that's really a shortcut for what you're doing there. Okay, be warned that that position you have your head in the beam, so you have to go quite far right. Mm -hmm. All right, don't cross the beams. We all know that's something you must not do. <laughs> all right, fine. So let's make a bit of a start. Um, one thing that I want to propose for you today uh, is the idea of pair programming. Now there's a lot to get through. Um, I've written 12 parts. Uh, in average, we usually get through about five or six of them. Uh, and in my experience, uh, and the experience of more qualified educators than me, the most people you can actually teach coherently in a classroom is about 14. Um, so uh, if we all try and go this, through this individually, we are going to go slowly. My alternative proposed to you guys is that you'll pair up with the person sitting next to you, you put down one of the computers and you work on a single computer, and that means that you can help each other with issues, that I'll be able to run around, thanks to my glamorous assistance as well, and help you when you can't move forwards, and as the whole classroom, we'll be able to get through more stuff and there'll be more learning. Um, you will be able, in your own time, to take the handout home and go through it all in detail. I'm always here to answer questions if you have difficulties going through it. My full tutorial is online at tdddjangotutorial.com. There's even going to be a book that you can totes get for free. Um, so that is my proposal to you uh, today, um, is to do pair programming to try and get through a little bit faster. Test-driven development is closely associated with extreme programming, which proposes pair programming. Pair programming is fun, it helps you learn, um, it's good for your health, uh, and all sorts of other things. So, um, who is up for the idea of pair programming? Uh, who would much rather prefer go through it on their own? Okay, just one person. 
well, let's see, one, two, since there are three of you there, if you guys would like to swap seats, then you, got, you two can pair and you can be on your own. Uh, and that is not bad, just one rebel. Do, do, do. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we all ready? So as I said earlier, my name is Harry Percival. Thank you very much for coming to my tutorial. I'm honored to see so many of you here today. Um, it's actually a little overwhelming. Um, and uh, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm giving this talk, uh, and then talk to you guys about what you know and, and, and discuss how we're going to go through the day. Um, so who would like to hear my uh, TDD story? Yeah. <laughs> so I am... Um, I first learned, I mean, I'm quite a young programmer, right? There, so if you're expecting to come here and learn from some sort of Yoda master, uh, that is not the case. Uh, they say you go from sort of journeyman, uh, so from apprentice uh, to journeyman to master in, in any profession or discipline. Uh, and I am at the very best a sort of early journeyman. Just finished my apprenticeship. So um, the reason I'm spreading this stuff is because it's all fresh in my mind. I think I've learned from some amazing people. Um, and so I'm trying, hoping to sort of give that to you guys from the perspective of someone who's a a recent convert, um, but where I first, really first learned about uh, TDD was in a book called Dive Into Python. Who's heard of that? Okay, like it's one of the standard Python um, teaching books, and uh, you get to about chapter 10, don't you? And um, it has a little story in there about test-driven development. It goes, okay, I've taught you all about Python now, you know all your for loops and your list comprehensions, wow, uh, and stuff. Um, now let me tell you about test-driven development. He, he does this little example with uh, Roman numerals, showing, look, if I write loads of tests up front, it's much easier for me to build a Roman numeral calculator because I can just run the test and know that I'm getting it right. Um, and it also means that it's much harder to break it and, uh, and introduce new bugs and regressions and so on. And I thought, I mean, I don't know if any of you read that same book, you maybe thought the same thing as me. I thought, great, that sounds really cool. Actually, that's, I can definitely see that makes a lot of sense. You know, that sounds like a really grown-up, professional, uh, cautious, sensible way of programming. And I, I think, you know, that is the kind of thing that you should do. Um, and then what happened is I had my first client and my first project and there were deadlines and you know all of my good intentions just went straight out the window. Uh, and I was like, whatever, testing, no time for that. Sounds like it'll take ages. And besides, from like the full height of my three weeks of experience of programming in Python, you know, I thought I was pretty shit hot. Uh, so, you know, I probably didn't need them. I was smart enough. You know, I was going to be, I was going to just, I was going to do it. I was going to be smart and I could handle it. And I didn't need tests and I was going to get away with it and it would be fine. Uh, and actually, it was fine at first. Um, at first, it was fine. I had a small application. I could just go and test it manually. I had a few screens. I wrote a bit of code here. A new thing appeared over there and like I could check it and it worked fine. And if I broke it, I would easily tell if I broke it because I could just go and take a look. Um, but then, you know, as the weeks moved on and I started to have more than just two or three files, there were five or six files, several apps, many models, I started getting into dangerous territory, like, oh, don't repeat yourself. Well, in that case, I better have, like, abstract classes and multiple inheritance and overrides, and, and I started using eval statements, and, like, pretty soon I just had a massive mess. I didn't know what depended on what. I couldn't refactor anything. I would like, oh, go and think about changing a little thing over here. And, and then, then I was like, oh, God, I forgot that that thing over there inherits from it. So I maybe I've just, I broke, I did, I, and I couldn't, I just, I, I was stuck. Like, I couldn't, development was like painful. I was scared of making changes to my code. I started accumulating technical debt. Um, and, I, and I pretty soon had an unmaintainable mess. Um, so that was quite a learning experience. Has anybody been through something a bit like that? There you go. So, um, 
Next, I went on to a, a company called Resolver Systems, which is now Python Anywhere, and they told me all about TDD, and so I was open to the ideas. Um, bit of housekeeping. So I'm talking pretty fast. It's because I'm nervous. Um, is everyone just about keeping up with what I'm saying? I know some people might have English as a second language. Um, so if I ever talk too fast and you lose track, just put your hand up saying, Harry, slow down, man. I can't, I don't, what are you saying? Uh, and, and I'll slow down. That's fine. That's actually good for everybody. Um, so you'd be doing the room a favor, probably, if you tell me to slow down. Um, yeah, and in general, I want to make sure that we all go through this and we all learn it together. So I want to make sure that we go through at the speed of the slowest pair in the room. I want to make sure that absolutely everyone gets everything that we go through. So every so often, I'm going to ask a question and say, all right, now, uh, everyone type this in, and then you should see this. Now, does that work? All right, and when I ask questions like that, yeah, don't just sort of nod when what you actually mean is, no, I don't have that. Yeah? Just say no. That's fine. Again, you're doing everyone a favor. Don't be embarrassed. Just say, look, I don't get it. And then uh, Michael or I or one of my glamorous assistants will come around and we'll sort it out. And we'll make sure we all get through it. Um, OK, so far. All right. Um, so uh, Resolver Systems then. I showed up there and they said, aha, Harry, you see, your problem is, is that you don't do test-driven development. Let us show you how we do it. And you'll see that that will. Um, save you from many of the perils that, or many of the, uh, the traps that you've fallen into. Um, and so like, I, was, I was open to the idea of, of test-driven development and testing, um, but I wasn't quite ready for the kind of extreme testing approach that, that they were about to teach me. Like, it, the way we did it, we tested absolutely everything. Right? There are functional tests which test the application by driving a browser and looking at it from the point of view of the user. And there are unit tests that test every single function, every single class, every single little thing. And I believe me that although I thought I'd maybe learned a lesson, I was still plenty arrogant enough to go, oh, come on, you must be joking. This is way too many tests. And like just dragging my feet and trying to sort of take shortcuts and cut corners and, and say, come on, we don't need all these tests. Like that one's really simple. We don't need that test. Like we can just we can get away without doing that one. They'd be like, no, Harry, come on. Um, and it took a long time, um, but I've finally sort of come around to like having asked all the questions and demanding an explanation and, and needing a justification for everything. Um, uh, I was quite a pain in the ass. Um, I've come around to see that you know this is a thing that really works, um, and that's what I want to convey to you today. It's like a sort of a really, really rigorous test-driven development, um, where you can test absolutely everything and go from all the tiny steps. And this is the kind of thing that will make sure that you never get into trouble. Um, and so when we're going through today, we're going to do a lot of really simple tests and really trivial tests um, where you, know, you might think like me, oh, OK, you know, we could get away without doing all of these tests. We could just test the complicated things and leave these things. That is your decision. What I'm suggesting, though, is that I'm trying to teach a discipline here. Like TDD is not something that comes naturally. Just like my first experience, as soon as you get the chance, you're going to get lazy. You're going to drop it. Um, so it's something you have to force yourself to do. It's something that doesn't come naturally. And so I think to really learn it, it's like a discipline, like any martial art. You have to go through some katas, some things that seem a little pointless, but you do them every day until they're really ingrained in your head. And once you feel you've mastered them, that's when you can start to bend the rules and to say, OK, well, maybe I don't need these bits over here, but I do need these bits over there. So what I'm trying to take you through is, a, is a quite an academic or a rigorous or, a, or like a really thorough TDD, which is the kind of thing that will get you, onto get you out of trouble when you have really complicated code. So it might seem trivial with simple examples, um, but what we're really learning here is a discipline. Does that make sense? Yes. OK. Fine. Ah. Um, who's bored of the sound of my voice already? Fine. Uh, so uh, who in the room then? Uh, who have we got here that is a total beginner that's only just learned Python? Hooray, hooray. OK, several of you. Welcome. You've chosen the best programming language. It is pure joy. Um, what about Django? Anybody here that's uh, never used Django? Okay, yeah, yeah, fine, a few people. Um, uh, presumably a few of you are new to testing, never done any kind of testing? Nobody's never done any kind of testing. So all of the people who put their hands up so far have got to put up their hand again, pretty much by definition. Pretty much, yeah. Or at least all the Python newbies. Um, and anybody here ever used Selenium? One, two, three. What are you guys doing here? Come on. Hmm? OK. Well, so I hope you take you through. Um, so this is a tutorial aimed at beginners. So like even people who are quite new to Python, I'm really planning to take this step by step. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. There are no stupid questions. 
what you'll probably find is you're asking something that even the experts that have been doing it for ages are just wondering to themselves but are a bit too shy to ask. So ask the questions, put your hand up, stop me, and we'll get through it. Da, da, da. Okay, tools. Yep. All right, here's one for you. Okay. If you're a, uh, you've got a big code base, yep. and you're about to do a big refactor, you don't yep. have any test, yep. you know that it's a good idea, you yep. start adopting it, where do you start? Okay, let me take that a little bit later on in the session. So the, um, the, pr the, the general idea of this tutorial today is that we're going to go through the Django tutorial as if you're starting from a greenfield project. So what I want to do is give you kind of the tools if you're, if you're starting something from scratch, this is something you could do for your next big project, your next hobby, you might just go, okay, well I'm going to start using TDD from nothing, and that's a good way of learning. If you're starting with an existing project like I did, when I started learning TDD, I was then able to go back to my old project and start applying tests incrementally, um, but it's quite a different story, and so if you like we can talk about that. Um, separately. Cool. Good question. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Okay. Anybody here using Windows? Have you all got Git installed? Now Git comes with a little uh, command line tool called Git Bash. Have you found that? Uh, so there's five people. So put up your hands if you're using Windows. Put up your other hand if you found the Git Bash command line tool. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so let's take a look and make sure you find that. That's the one you should be using to type in all the commands because that has all the, you know, the, the same syntax as I'm using in the, uh, in the examples. All right. So as I said, who's anybody done the official Django tutorial? Has anybody stepped through that? Okay. So my plan is to go exactly through the same tutorial, but at every single stage we're going to be doing rigorous testing because there's none of that in the Django tutorial. So we're going to start... Uh, by writing some tests for every little bit. We're going to build the same app, which is a polls voting app, um, but we're going to have it with full tests. Um, okay, so we start, but basically, so if you've seen the Django tutorial, it takes you through building a really simple application that does voting, it has a database, it has a Django admin site, which lets administrators administer things, and we're going to try and get through all of that. Um, so, the first thing I want to do then is make sure that we've got everyone set up in pairs. So, uh, everybody turn to the person next to you, Decide whose laptop you're going to use. Close the other laptop for now. Uh, and make sure you can agree on a text editor that you can both just about use. So like if you're a VI fanatic and the person next with you uh, isn't, you know, spare them and just open up a copy of Gedit or, uh, or uh, TextPad or whatever it'll be. Um, and make sure you've got access to the command line as well. Okay, for any late arrivals, I'm going to need you to sit, guy, find someone to sit next to. Uh, and we're doing pair programming today, so make sure you can find someone and share a laptop, one between two. Okay, have you all agreed on one computer between two? Do me a favor and just for the first couple of minutes, like really close the other computer, put it between, okay, and so I want you, while we're doing pair programming, like swap every so often. One person types, the other one comments and asks questions and gives suggestions. And then, you know, every time we swap to like a new file or a new thing, swap the computer, let the other person have a go. All right. You guys over there, who's pair programming with who? Who's got the laptop? All right, whose laptop are you using? Who's in what pair? What about you guys? Okay, you're together. What about over here? What's going on? What? So your, it's going to be your laptop. It's his laptop. All right, so close the other laptops, please. You can reopen them. Hmm? Oh, you've got, have you got a handout? Yeah, would you like a paper version of that? Yeah, he's just trying to, trying to cheat over there and sneakily, <laughs> sneakily not pair program. I don't mean to bang on about it, but if, like, really, if we do the pair program, we're going to get through so much more stuff. 
uh, and so much more learning done. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right, fine. So the very first thing that we're going to do is start a functional test. So in the kind of testing that I'm proposing, there are more or less two types of tests. Uh, one are unit tests, and they're the kind of tests you might have seen in Drive into, uh, Dive into Python or other uh, uh, programming examples, and they're all about really testing individual bits of code, functions, classes. Functional tests are more about testing the whole application from the point of view of the user. Other people will call that an acceptance test or, uh, or an integration test, whatever. The point is, it's like a high-level test from the point of view of the user. And what we use for that is a tool called Selenium that opens up a real web browser and you can get that web browser to open up a web page, click on things, check what's on the page, see what happens with JavaScript, um, and things like that. So that's the first thing we're going to do, is get um, Selenium to start up, open a web browser, uh, I'll be right with you, um, and uh, navigate to a page on our local computer. So what we want to do is we want to say, OK, to, to even get started with this project, I need to be able to have uh, a dev server, like my website, on my computer. Right? And I need to be able to go and look at it. Uh, and so like step zero is making sure that Django is installed and can spin up at least a basic web page. And by default, when you first install Django and start a project, it will say a little, pop a little screen up saying, welcome to Django. So for us, even before we install Django, we actually write a test that says, all right, let's make sure that we can test that we've installed Django. So that's what we're going to do here with this from Selenium import web driver. Um, we open up Firefox. We tell it to get localhost, which is the local PC. Port 8000 is the deep real place that Django puts its dev server. Uh, and then we check that it really is Django there by using that assertion saying, OK, the browser title should say Django. Uh, print OK, browser quit. Um, and then if you run that file, Python functional tests, you should find that it fails. You get an error, and it says, assertion error. No, because you haven't even installed Django or got the server running. So this is what's called an expected failure. There's going to be a lot of these. The first time you run your test, it should fail. Then you write some code that gets it to pass. So that's our first objective, is let's write a test that fails because we haven't installed Django yet. And in a minute, we'll install Django and get it to pass. So go typey, 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 from Selenium import web driver, et cetera. Uh, all of the, this stuff that I'm going through here on the screen is the same as the handout, so you can copy along from both. I do encourage you to type everything in at the beginning. Uh, later on, I'll have little ways of getting you to copy and paste and whatnot. OK. Um, so there was a question. Oh, there, catching up. All right, yeah. Um, no, if you use the uh, HTTPS clone, it should just come down. Okay, yeah, the other thing I should say is I'm suggesting you actually do all of this in, when you've cloned my repository, you'll have a bunch of files in there like the handout. I'm suggesting you use that as the folder that you work in. The reason for that is later you'll be able to check out files that I've pre-prepared to copy over your files. All right. So basically, as soon as you've got a thing saying assertion error, put your hand up and say, yes, I'm done. All right. OK, several people. There you go. That's fantastic. All right, let's let everyone else catch up. OK, where are my glamorous assistants? There's one, two. Anybody else? Maxim never showed up, I guess. Never mind. All right. This is the point at which you should start running around helping people checking they've all got a little screen saying assertion error. Everyone, as my glamorous assistants come round, show them a screen with assertion error written on it, or if you don't have that, get them to help you. Yes. Uh, the question there is, I can't find this handout file in your repo. The reason for that is probably it's on a branch called PyCon underscore 2013. So 
So if you're uh, looking around in the repo and there's no PyCon 2013 handout dot ASCII doc, uh, git check out PyCon 2013. I'll just write that over here for you. It is not. If you don't have the repo, don't worry. Um, we'll figure something out later on. Okay, if you haven't got the repository, don't worry about it for now. We can sort it out later. We can catch up. Question there. Okay, you shouldn't have any kind of database error or anything like that at this stage. Um, you should just be running one file. Django isn't even installed. Uh, so it should just say assertion error. Let me come and have a look. I should Okay, who has not managed to get the assertion error? Does that mean, ah, oh, okay, all right, couple more minutes. Yeah. Everybody else, make sure we're on part one of the handout now, so you're fetching localhost 8000, not uh, Google. So I'll just go through this line by line, make sure it's clear. Um, Webdriver.firefox is Selenium's class for driving the web browser. Um, we're using Firefox for the browser. Browser.get just tells it to go and navigate to a particular URL and load it up. Um, and then assert, who's not come across the assert keyword? Come on, people new to Python? All right. So assert is a special keyword in Python that says, um, the following statement should be true, and if it's not, raise an error, because there must be a problem. Um, so basically, it'd be the same as if I wrote, uh, if Django in browser.title print OK, else raise an error. Uh, and that would be equivalent to that. And then browser.quit just tidies it up and shuts down the browser again. And so you should find Firefox pops up and then disappears very, very quickly, and it just shows assertion error. Uh, has anybody else not quite got that? Firefox stays open. Yeah, so Firefox stays open. Have you got the browser.quit? Oh, right, okay, yeah, no, you're right. Thank you, all right, there is one person paying attention there. The browser will stay open, won't it? Um, basically, because we go raising the exception there, it's not even gonna get to the quit, which is annoying. Um, so there should be an annoying little Firefox window hanging around there, uh, being in the way, and so we're going to go and tidy that up in a little moment. Thank you. All right. That's, that's what I want to hear, because sometimes I might be talking absolute nonsense. You have to keep me on track as well. This is a two-way thing. Okay. So we've now got an assertion error. Selenium is saying, look, there is no Django website running on your PC. Um, let's get one. Uh, so the command to do that is... DjangoAdmin.py, start project, my site. So in your little terminal, uh, you should be able to type in DjangoAdmin.py, that's a little uh, uh, script that Django installs for you. It's, it, yep, it's possible. Um, so either Django Admin, and so this will tab complete, right guys? So type checking Django dash, ah, uh, and then tab complete. You get DjangoAdmin.py, start project, my site. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna create a folder for you. Um, 
called my site with a manage.py and a subfolder called my site, which is a little weird. Uh, and then you'll have all the rest of my files there. <laughs> okay. And once you've got that, check that all those files are there. If they're there, okay. CD into my site and try a python manage.py run server. Now, you want to open this up in a separate console from the one you were running your test in earlier, and then try running the test again. And with a bit of luck, the test will then pass. All right, so this is still part one. I'm going to do it myself just to prove to you that it is possible. Okay, there's functional tests. Python functional test.py. There you go. Assertion error. Okay, if you ever see this error, that port is already in use. That means you've already got one of the Django test servers probably running somewhere else. So we need to go and find that somewhere. What have we got here? <laughs> Okay, so even I can do it. It must be possible. Like, I am not a great programmer, so if I can just do that live in front of you with shaky hands uh, and in demo mode, it must be possible. Has everyone managed to get that? The okay? No? You've got it. Yes, excellent. All right, who's not quite got this yet? Does that mean everyone has it? All right, don't just say no. You're catching up over there, sir. You've got it, or you've not got it. All right. Uh, can I get a little help from my father? I'll, I'll come over there. <laughs>
All right, big win. There's a lot of us getting through it, but this is going to be the real thing. So uh, even at this stage, if you're using version control, you can do this if you like. You could do a little git commit and say, all right, well, I've got that sorted. I've got Django installed. I've got it running. So this could be your first commit in your project. Git commit dash M, you know, initial commit, Django installed, enter. Um, if you feel like doing that, you're welcome to start a new branch inside my, uh, inside my repo and do that. Um, but don't worry about it for now. Uh, the, uh, there is an advanced task on there, I think. Uh, remind me what it is. What is the advanced task in this bit? Changing the ports. Has anybody managed to do that? It's not very important. That's just to keep you guys quiet uh, while everybody else, you know, just makes sure they're up to speed. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, yeah, let me uh, just come on. All right. Ba -ba. What's the question? Uh, through an accident of chance, you might be like zooming ahead and like getting this finished before everybody else. You can always, at that point, if you're definitely finished and I'm still banging on about something you've finished, um, you could maybe open up the other laptop and try and get it done on there as well and just make sure you can do it twice. That's as good as testing, doing something twice. Okay, shall we move on to part two? So one of the things that was annoying about that test is that when it failed, it left that kind of Firefox window lying around. Um, also, you probably noticed that when, um, when it failed, it just said this message, assertion error, which isn't really very helpful. It'd be much better if um, it said, OK, look, I was looking for the string Django in the browser title, but the browser title actually said page not found or problem loading page or maybe something totally different. Um, now, so you could roll your own. You can uh, assert takes a second argument, a sort of error message, um, and you could do a try, accept, and stuff like that. But uh, unit testing is something that's been going on for ages, and just like uh, so many things, there is some tools in the standard library. Uh, unit test is the standard library module that's here to help us for that. Um, and uh, so we can convert our really simple functional test into using unit test. Um, so let's go and take a look at this guy. Dip, dip, dip. All right. While we're at it, um, we're also going to say we want to move on as well a little bit and say, okay, we're not just looking for Django being installed, but we actually want to start having our own website, not just Django's default website. Our website's going to be about polls, so we're going to change our little test to say instead of assert Django is in the browser.title, assert poll. At least the word poll should be in my title, and that will tell me that it's my website now, not Django's. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So let's talk about that, yeah. Um, you're using, I'm using a, two little special methods in unit tests called setup and teardown. Um, so uh, before we just had a Python file that would run step, 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 step. Uh, in unit test, it says, okay, you organize your tests into classes. Um, the classes represent a bunch of tests that are related. And then in that class, any method that starts with test, T-E-S-T -E underscore, is going to be a test class. And that is some code that's going to get run automatically by your test runner. Uh, uh, to, to, you know, that's where your test is going to be. Set up and tear down are two special methods that get run before and after every test. So if you have five or six test underscore methods, set up and tear down are going to get run five or six times each. Uh, and we use them for doing stuff that's kind of common to many tests or that's just kind of housekeeping. 
Um, so appropriately for us is maybe starting the web driver browser, we'll put that in setup, and then like quitting, we'll put that in teardown. The good thing about teardown is it runs no matter what. So even if your test fails or has an exception or breaks, teardown still gets run and tidies stuff up. Uh, the other thing to note is implicitly wait. Um, when you tell Selenium to do something, like click on a page or type something in or refresh something, um, if you then go ahead and give it another command straight away, it might complete, before the page is totally finished loading, it might say, oh gosh, that's not working. So we say, give yourself, if you find you know, I'm asking you to do something and it's not there on the page, Selenium, wait three seconds, try again. And so that's that. It does, yeah. Yeah, so it's as fast as it can be, but it will wait up to three seconds if it needs to. No, exactly. No, no, so, so it, is, it is intelligent in that sense. <laughs> um, well, I, I, the implicit wait command you call once, and then every subsequent command to Selenium implicitly will wait three seconds if it can't work for whatever reason. So that, that's why it's implicit. Does that make sense? Okay, and so we transform our little assert statement into a special method called assert in. Okay, let's try that. So instead of using, oh, I've got a capital N there, that will work. Instead of using just the straight assert, um, unit test gives you loads of little helper functions which will help you make assertions. Uh, so there's assert in, you can assert equal, you can assert true, assert false, and each time it's going to give you a sensible error message. So if I say self.assert equal A and B, it'll say, hey, A not equals B, instead of just error. And assert in will say X is not in Y. Let's go and see if that works. Yes, you got me. Dilda. What? Okay, and the last bit is, ha yeah, yeah, it's great to actually have to do this, then you really have to explain everything, isn't it? Um, to run unit tests, uh, you can either, there's a special Python-y command line for saying find all the unit tests in this file, or we can make an if dunder name equals main. So people who are new to Python, um, you, there's a, uh, this little special command here is the way you get a file uh, uh, to make it runnable and run certain Okay, so if you get a file that defines a bunch of stuff and you then want to run them, this is a way of having a little main method like you would have in C. So this says, okay, well, as I'm running this, if my name is main, then I can do, do, do done the main unit test dot main. All right, try that. Hooray! Okay, it shouldn't be okay yet. All right, poll. So that was me passing again with the Django in the browser.title. If I now change this to a poll, that should now fail. So this is the error that you guys should be seeing if it's all typed in okay. Who's got that? You guys are all way ahead of me. That's amazing. Who's not got that? All right, there's some questions over here. <laughs>
Okay, very good. So we got as far as that, which is a, a sort of expected failure. We're going to see a lot of these. When you change a test and it breaks and you know it should, that's an expected failure. That's actually good news. Um, and our next stage is to write the uh, functional test as comments. Um, so maybe this is a bit more talk about functional testing and unit testing and how they differ. Uh, because functional tests are about really testing the, the application from the point of view of the user, um, you should find that they're quite, they're, they're story-like. Um, it should be like the user can go onto the site and do this and this and that. So if you've ever done um, ty uh, various types of agile programming, it's a lot like a user story. Does anybody know what a user story is? Who knows what a user story is? Who was key? You, sir, explain what a user story is, quick. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So it's, a, it's basically a way of capturing the requirements for your application. Um, and just saying, all right, well, the, my requirements for this uh, application is the user should be able to do this. If they click on this, they'll see this. If they get it wrong, they'll see the following error message. Um, uh, and so that's what we can do with our functional test. We can actually say, right, well, our functional test should actually be almost exactly user stories. Um, and so different teams will use that in different ways. You might actually be able to show your functional test to a client, for example. Um, if not the actual code, at least the comments. So we use the comments to make a sort of human readable story out of our functional test. Um, so what I've got over here da -da -da -da, um, is I'm suggesting then that we say, all right, well, what do we want this application to be able to do? Let's write that out from the point of view of the user. And then as we go, we can start filling in the Selenium commands that are actually going to go and, and check on all of those things. Um, so you should give your user a name. I've called mine Elspeth. But you can call you guys is whatever you want. Um, I've used Gertrude. Um, Harold is the old classic from Resolver Systems. Um, your test users are quite special characters um, because what they tend to do is get everything wrong in every single possible way before getting it right. So they'll submit forms without filling it in. They'll put the name and not the last name. They'll write incorrect email addresses. So they're, they're strange psychological characters, um, the users from functional tests. But let's go. And so Elspeth goes in. She sees it's about polls. So like they have to be things the user can see, right? So she sees that the title of the browser says polls. Um, she finds uh, a poll already on there called, how awesome is TDD? Um, now, we're not right ready to write that bit. So I've just put a little self.fail as a way of telling unit tests, no matter what, just fail at this point with this error message. So that's a little reminder to go finish, finish writing the test. Um, but anyway, we want her to be able to go that. She goes onto a results page. Um, and then she's going to see a form, she's going to be able to clear. So I'm basically saying these are the things that Elsa will be able to do on the site and what she'll see. Um, so start typing some of that stuff. Um, if you haven't quite finished, don't worry. We'll be able to catch up later on by doing a little cheeky git checkout. <laughs> are there any questions there about functional tests or, or that whole idea of user stories? Does that make sense? Hands up who thinks that's stupid. Oh, there was a little hand up there, but I don't think he meant it. Okay. Da, 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 da. All right, so we'll skip that up. The last thing I want you to do at this point um, is to take our little functional test file and move it into your Django project. So we started a Django project. It's called My Site. Um, functional test at the moment should be outside of it. Let's put it inside just to be clean and neat and tidy. Um, and this is a point, again, if you were doing uh, version control, this is a point at which you'd probably go, OK, do a commit, converted my unit test to, to, to being a, converted my functional test using unit test, um, started writing the user story as comments. You know, that's a good place to sort of save your work kind of thing. <laughs> Who did the advanced task? I'll be right with you. Who did the advanced task? No one did the advanced task. That must mean that you're not ahead. Yes? What could you use assert items equal for? You didn't do the advanced. OK. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's just for comparing lists, really. And so if you're saying two lists, it doesn't really matter what order the stuff in them is. Um, but I want them to be equal. So for database queries, that might be a good idea. OK. Uh, there was a question over here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, yeah, probably in the break, depending on how far we get through, it'll be obvious that there's a good point to talk about that. Mm-hmm. No. So for now, we're just writing the comments. And that's a thing that if you had a client, for example, you might say, OK, let's talk to the client and make sure we write down some comments that they understand that we all agree on. Then you can write the test later. And you don't have to write it all at once. You can write it bit by bit. OK. So 
So uh, if you've just added a whole load of comments, it should be running exactly in the same way. So if you run it again, it should still say assertion error polls not in Welcome to Django. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, are we all ready to move on to part three? Okay, let's do it. Okay, so we started a Django project. That basically means a website. Um, uh, and then Django encourages us to, to structure your code into things that it calls apps. Uh, and the general theory is you might have many different projects, many different apps, but sometimes you might find that one app is a thing that you can reuse from one project to the next. You might be able to use some third-party apps that other developers um, have done. I don't think I've ever managed to make an app personally that I've ever reused on another project, but that's my shortcoming. Has anybody ever done that, reused a Django app in a different project? Yes? Okay, so it is possible. Very good. Um, <laughs> Irrespective of whether you ever reuse them, it's still a good idea, a nice sensible way of organizing your code. So if you go into your um, uh, MySite folder, type python manage.py start app polls, it's going to create a little folder in there called polls, and it's going to put four files in it, dunderinit.py, which makes it a Python module, models.py, which is all about database stuff, views.py, which is all about um, processing URLs, and tests.py, which I'm sure you're guessing is something that we're going to go and take a look at. Okay, so you should get a directory tree like that. So we've got those tests in there, and that is Django suggesting that we make some unit tests. So we've talked about how functional tests are at the top level, unit tests are at a lower level. I'll talk about that more in a little bit in detail. But we want to be able to make sure that we can run our unit tests as well as running our functional tests. Um, and we want to be able to make sure that when we write unit tests, uh, the ones that we create are actually going to be run automatically when, when we run our little test running command. So the way I'm going to actually test my tests here, by going in and having a look at test.py and deliberately breaking um, the test that it's given me. So let's have a look. Polls tests. Okay. Polls tests, you'll have a look. If you go into open it up in your editor, you'll see something like this. Django fills it with a few helpful comments. Uh, it's a really simple test. And it says test assert that 1 plus 1 always equals 2. What I'm going to do is deliberately break that. Hip, dip, dip. Okay, apparently. Oh, three. Got caps lock or something. So I'm deliberately breaking that and say, ah, let's assert that 1 plus 1 equals 3. And now when I run my unit test, I'm expecting that to fail. Um, so let's try that. To run Django's tests, it's a manage.py command. You'll find manage.py. Manage.py is like Django's Swiss army knife. Um, little tool command, and you can do all sorts of things. We've seen it can start an app. It can also run your tests. Guess what the command to run the unit tests in Django is? Test. Yes, well done. What happens? Ah! That's an expected failure. So if you did that and it happened, that's a good news. This is what we're expecting. We're saying, oh gosh, uh, Django can't even run tests yet, so this is something we need to develop. So again, test-driven development. I've tried to run tests. The tests are telling me what to do next. Uh, and they're here saying, okay, right at the bottom there of this horrible traceback, um, you'll see what it's actually complaining about is that settings.databases is improperly configured. Um, so most websites have a database. Um, whenever you're running tests, uh, you're probably going to need a database. So Django is saying, I don't even know how to run tests until you tell me how to configure my database. And you do that in a file called settings.py. Let's go and open that now. <laughs> databases. You'll find some database. Again, loads of the Django default files are filled with helpful comments. And the very first line in here says, what backend do you want to use for your database? Django will let you swap databases, will let you use all sorts of different ones with the same API, which is wonderful. We love Django. Uh, we're going to use SQLite because that's the simplest and most straightforward. And SQLite 3. OK, so I've made one change to one line of code. Let's see if that works. What the hell? See, Vim has two modes. Beep repeatedly. And Fuck everything up. OK. There you go. For those of you that can't see that, it's running a whole bunch of tests. Look at all these tests. That's a little weird. I didn't write loads of tests. We've only written one test. Um, what's going on there? Uh, what, when you say Python manage.py test, Django goes, OK, I'm going to run all the tests for your project. And your project includes Django, obviously. 
Um, and any of the standard Django tools, like maybe the admin site or the middleware or the templating framework. And so it's going to say, look, let me run all the tests. And so it's run all the tests. The other thing that's weird about this is that it hasn't failed. I've got a test in there that says 1 plus 1 equals 3, and that's passed. Um, something is amiss. All right, but we can drill down. You can tell Django to test one specific application uh, instead of all of them. And the command for that is Python manage.py test polls. So that's the name of our app. We created it earlier. Start app polls. So manage.py test polls. Well, that should get us somewhere. What? What? Okay, but I just, but just, we, just right now, we said start app polls. Like, what is Django? Well, the thing is, um, you actually have to tell Django twice um, when, when you're installing an app. So not only do you have to start the app, but you also have to say to Django, yes, no, I really meant it. Um, I want to use this app in my project. And the place you do that is also in settings.py. So if you open settings.py, find the installed apps bit, which is down here. Add an item to the bottom here called polls. So I wanted to use my app as well. OK, don't forget the trailing comma. What is this? OK, I think I know what's going on there. Da -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. And we try again. Ha ha, that's more like it. The laws of maths and physics are still the same. Two does not equal three. That is the expected failure. Who's got that? You guys are all ahead of me again. That's wonderful. Everybody else? Uh, who needs some help? Okay, has everyone got that? Who's not got that? We should have two not equals three. Who's not got that? You guys need a little help there? Almost. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. Does it say two not equals three on your screen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, all right, fantastic. That means we are all, uh, question? No, nope, we're all there. Great, so we've managed to get, uh, we've got a functional test which is failing, saying, look, this website is not about polls. We've got a unit test that we know how to run, that we've deliberately broken, and that proves to us we can run it. Um, if you feel like it, you can go manage our PyTest and run all the tests, and you should see, instead of running 419 tests that all pass, it runs 420 tests, one of which fails. Um, our next stage is saying, all right, we've got a functional test that's failing. We now use unit tests to drive the individual little bits of code um, that we write. So what is a website? Um, a website is a basically a way of taking users' requests for particular URLs and deciding what to do them and returning a response. Okay, so that's a, a user's browser makes a request, an HTTP request. That request gets sent to a URL. The server goes, all oh, right, for this URL and this type of request, I probably have a little function um, that knows how to respond to it, and the response I send back is some HTTP response, some HTML. Um, so that's what we've got, request, URL, response, um, and probably a function to give the response. So that's going to give us uh, two units. So there's two things we need to figure out, really. One is that a particular URL probably should map to a particular function um, that we want to generate our home page. So our URL for the home page, which is the slash URL or the nothing URL, we want to make sure that um, when Django is asked for that URL, it's going to call a particular function that we're going to define. So that's going to be our first test is, can Django uh, map a URL to a function? And our, third, on our second test is, um, does, if we call that function with a user's request, can it return some given HTML? Very specifically, we want to make sure we can put polls in the title. So those are two tests. Now that is some very pernickety unit testing right there. Um, who here has done unit testing before? Have you ever thought of doing something as pernickety as testing that the Django can resolve a URL? Um, 
But that is the kind of thing you can do. Uh, you might think that's ridiculous, um, but actually when I sort of came up with this, um, my boss said, wow, we don't do that. We should do that at work, actually, testing URLs. It's simple in this particular case, but URLs can get complicated. They can have regular expressions. They have to sort of chop up little bits. They need to pass arguments to functions. When they get complex, if you've got a little unit test for them, um, it can make your life much, much easier. Uh, so we'll start with that. So we take our old uh, test, which has got that sort of 1 plus 1 equals 3, and we're going to change it to uh, import Django's resolve function. That's the, Django, the, the function that Django uses internally to map a sort of URL to a function. And we're actually going to call it with a URL for slash and assert that its result, which I'm calling found, um, has a dot func, which is the function that this maps to, says Django, is home page. Uh, and so I'm going to expect that later on we're going to build a, fi a, view, a function in views called home page. Does that make sense? So that's what we're doing there. Take the resolve, import home page from polls.views, call resolve with slash, and I want to assert that that finds my home page view. Tick, 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 tick. Let's see if we can write that. <laughs> May as well get rid of these comments. We know what we're doing now. Doing a test import test case. Polls.views, that's where I'm going to keep my view function for the home page. Uh, test the root URL, resolves to the home page view. It's always good to have like nice, verbose, descriptive names for your tests. Um, they sometimes get very long, like test function does this with that and passes result to thing. Um, what you tend to find is like once that function name gets insanely long, that probably means that your function is too complicated and you should split it up. So it's a good way of forcing yourself to keep your little bits atomic. Okay, so I've changed that. Let's see if we can run it. Another massive load of traceback. Um, it's saying I can't even import home page. So I've actually really put the, the, um, the what's the expression? The cart before the horse. Yep, I put the cart before the horse here, but that's what you do in unit testing. It's like you write your test first, even before you write any kind of test. That test never had a hope of passing because it was importing a view we've not even built yet. So let's just give it a minimal little thing that it can import. And so we're now getting into what's like called the, the unit test coding cycle. Um, and now we're going very slowly, but in real life, once you get used to unit testing, um, this goes very fast. You write a test, you can make a change to the code. Write a test, change the code. It goes chick, 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 moves quite quickly. And what you're going to do each time is look at the error that your test is giving you and write the minimal amount of code that gets your test to pass. So this is part of the TDD discipline or the methodology, is you only ever write the minimal amount of code that's going to address the current failure of your unit tests. So what is the minimal piece of code that I can write to make this pass? Everyone's looked at their handout, so you know the answer already. Who hasn't looked at the handout and knows the answer already? Who wants to take a guess? Come on, be brave. What's the minimal piece of code we can write to get this to pass? Write my view. OK, so that's not a bad answer. But actually, the real minimal thing <laughs> okay, so obviously that's counterproductive. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we can go into views.py. So the test is currently complaining that it can't uh, import a view called home page from this particular class. So the absolute minimal thing I can do is just put an object called home page. That is ridiculous, right? But like, yeah. So that is not a view. That is a, like the non object. That can't possibly be a view. But that's not the point. The point is the unit tests have just said one thing, which is I can't import an object called home page from views. So the minimal amount of code I can write is just put a thing called home page. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, and so none is the minimalist possible thing. So we can run it again. And what you'll find is that actually gets my tests a tiny little bit further. Now that it imports, it tries to run the test. And resolve, the actual resolve function has said, OK, look, I can't resolve the slash URL. So that's actually moved us forward. We don't even have to write the view yet, because what we're concentrating now on is the, uh, is the URLs and the resolve function. So what's it saying here? It's saying, OK, you asked me for the slash, and it's given you a 404, saying, look, I'm not configured yet. I don't know how to resolve the slash URL. So that's the very first bit of code that we're going to write in Django, um, is in a file called urls.py. urls.py is where you define your URL mappings. So let's open that up, urls.py. OK. And what we can do here is, like, by default, Django has included a bunch of comments and helpful things. Um, a URL 
uh, has three little uh, or two main attributes. The first one is a regular expression that says, what is the URL? Um, hat dollar means like the empty string or nothing or slash. They're all pretty much the same. Um, and then it maps to a view. You can either import the real view object and put it in there, the review function, or you can use this sort of dot notation. Um, what I'm going to do here is deliberately do it wrong. So I know that that's not going to work because it's not my home page yet. We'll just rerun it. And that's saying, oh, okay, there is no mysite.views.home. Yep, there isn't, but we have got a polls.views.home page. We made it earlier, didn't we? That little home page equals none. So let's go and change that. We want the URL, uh, the empty URL, to map to polls.views.home page. Okay, let's try that. All right, and now we get a new expected failure. So I've said to urls.py um, that slash should map to polls.views.homepage. I've tried to resolve that, and it said, OK, well, I've, I've tried your little home page thing that you gave me earlier, but it's not even a view, mate. So I'm not accepting that. And this is the point at which we're justified into turning our home page into something that looks a bit more like a view function. Um, but again, we're going to do so in an absolutely minimal way. So views.pay, instead of home page equals none, let's make home page into a function. I could use a lambda, yeah. Then it would be one line. But you know, we know it's going to go a little further than that. They're totally equivalent. Home page, nothing. All right, let's try that. So that's at least a function, if not a view function. And that passes. Bam! That is the first unit test pass. And notice that like, we've got a completely dummy function in views.py. It does nothing at all. Um, but that's forced us to make uh, a minimal function and to configure a URL. And we know for sure that someone that asks for slash is definitely going to get my view. So that's our first unit test and our first little bit of code. Pat ourselves on the back. Um, and you could even do a commit here and say, OK, minimal URL. Uh, and the good thing about that little unit test is you might be wondering, I've asked for slash and it's given me that view. Would it also work if I put the empty string? What if someone um, asks for... So we could even double that up and say, are they equivalent? Basically, the URL of nothing? Is that the same as slash? Let's find out. Zip. No. So you have to have a leading slash at the beginning of your URLs. OK, we've learned something new about Django. All right, so has everyone got that? The single passing unit test and URLs.py configured. Is that a yes? Who's not got that? <laughs> You've not got it. OK.
Shall we move on to the next bit? Question over there? Okay, so our next stage is um, we've mapped our URL, we want to write a view. Um, so, so far our functional test is saying I want um, the home page to say something about polls. So now let's write a view function that we can return some HTML for our user that's going to have views in it. Um, so let's go back to the unit test over here. I'm going to write this one from scratch without even looking at my notes. Let's see if I can get this right. So, we've checked the root URL as well as the home page. So, we're going to say test the home page returns correct HTML. So, again, the sort of function name there is really saying what I want to achieve. So, we've got home page imported here. So, I'm going to call the home page function. And I'm going to call it with the thing that the user would call it with, which is an HTTP request. So let's pop that in there, home page respect, and it's going to expect a response. So I'm going to start with that. Response is a home page request. What's request? Request is going to be an HTTP request. P request. All right. Oops. And HTTP request is a little Django class which wraps um, the requests that are coming from the browser. So I can import that over here from django.http import HTTP request. Fantastic. All right, so response, you won't be at all surprised to hear, is a member of the class HTTP response. Uh, and that has a special attribute called response.content, which is the text of the HTML. Um, and so I want to assert that the response.content um, has, let's see, well, if we want the browser title to have something to do with polls, we can have uh, poll all te things. All right. Great. OK, and what else do I need to make HTML that's kind of solid and is going to work in my browser? Um, well, I'm going to run the response.content should at least start with an HTML tag. So we can write that like this. Ship, HTML, ship. And the only other thing I really need to have minimally valid HTML, uh, and like this is some pretty bad HTML right here, but it'll work, um, is that it should probably close. Change till W ends with bang HTML. OK, what have I got here? Probably I've forgotten to close brackets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's a minimal test. Like this view function, hey? Have I got them backwards? Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I Yep. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, yeah. All of this should be in your polls test.py. All right, so this is what we're doing now. We're writing a unit test for polls. Yeah? OK, so basically, let's just get this passing in the moment, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, fine. What happens if we run this? Homepage takes no argument. So earlier on, we made a little function that did absolutely nothing. Um, uh, a view function needs to at least take the user's request, so let's change that. Minimal change, chip, 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 that's going to be a request. Views.py, add request, run again. None type has no attribute content. Well, at the moment, we're not even returning anything from that view, so now we need to ret return something, and it needs an attribute content. So we're going to return an HTTP response. Oop. Uh, response. And we're going to need to import that from django.http. Let's try that. OK, a minimal response which has absolutely no content. It doesn't start with HTML. And so you can see that at this stage, the tests are driving every single line of um, code that I'm writing. So we'll start with HTML. Like deliberately, we know this isn't even going to get past one thing. We're going to write it this slowly anyway. OK, title is done in that, so we can write that. Maybe I'm even going to copy and paste it straight from my test failure. Draw Shift C, FG. Insert, function V, escape. Didn't save. 
Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, ba -ba -ba. And then HTML. So what you should find is once you've got that test finished, that's going to drive you to maybe make four or five little changes to views.py one by one, just each time to get the, the test to go further. Until you get to a pass. Um, so that's what I'm going to get you to guys to do now. Um, I believe uh, there's meant to be a break at this stage. Um, so if you've got as far as that, um, take a look at the advanced task. Um, and we can go for a break. Uh, I'm just going to run around and make sure that everybody's got it. Uh, what else was I going to say at this point? OK, yeah. One thing. Um, you saw how I was in the sort of unit test code cycle there. Uh, and I'm doing things like uh, tiny little steps, like trivially small. Um, so Ken Beck, one of the great pioneers of test-driven development, said when he's teaching this sort of stuff, he says, look, do I actually expect you to work like this all the time? No. I just expect you to always be able to. So when it's really simple like this, yeah, we probably can skip a whole load of the steps. Um, and that's fine. But the point is, is to learn how to do it the really, really slow uh, and step-by-step -step and baby steps way, because when it's not a trivial case anymore, when you've got some really complicated application logic, when you're doing some refactoring that's changing core parts of the business, when you've got like, things that have been working for ages that you really want to make sure you don't break and it absolutely has to work, that's when you can fall back to these really, really slow step-by-step -step methods. And they're really going to save you from going wrong. Uh, hello. Uh, so yeah, just to say that again, uh, Michael, what time the break is now? Until what time? What time do we start again? OK, so it is now 10.20. 10.35, I'd like to start again. Um, I'm here to answer any questions uh, during the break. Uh, make sure you all get to this bit. Did you all have a good break? Yeah, it was great. There was coffee. Did you have a piece of fruit? You should do. I've got a cold. I've got to have fruit. You know, it's good for your health. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, quick question. How are you guys finding it so far? Hands up if you think it's going too fast. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hands up if you think it's going too slowly. Okay, so that is people think it's... Ah! Now you're going to disagree. Too slowly a little bit, you think? A bit. Okay, good. Um, all right. But it's good. Mm -hmm. it's good. Well, I prefer to make sure that everyone's got it rather than just leave some people confused and unhappy. Yeah, yeah. OK, so, so those people clearly feel that we're going too fast, but they're shy. That's all right. I'll take that as a 50-50 vote. Um, so for the second half, uh, we've got two choices. Uh, basically, we can either, I mean, you'll, you'll see that in my handout, there are 10 parts. And we're now at the end of part th four, is it? Uh, no, part three. So you know, we're 33% of the way through. Um, the future parts do get even longer. Uh, and we're halfway through the time we have allocated. Um, so we've got two choices. Basically, we can either proceed um, along the sort of story of the tutorial as it is, and each bit builds on the last bit, um, or we can try and skip ahead. Um, and so I was going to offer you that choice. Um, well, uh, so the next part is our view currently returns a raw HTML string, string and we're going to switch to using templates. Um, so that's Django's templating system, which lets you write an HTML file that looks like an HTML file, and then show you how to render that as a response, um, which is a pretty critical part of Django. Um, after that, we switch on the admin site. After that, we build our first um, model in the database. So I think if we did the straight through, we would get templates, the admin site, and our first model done. If we skipped ahead, I would suggest we skip ahead as if we've already done all that stuff and go straight to um, returning things directly into a template that we've made. Or the more I talk about this, the more I think we should just keep going with the incremental bit. Um, yeah. OK. So the next bit extends Selenium a little bit. Um, we use a little bit more of that. Um, but the final bit does do more with Selenium. Yeah, so if we did skip ahead, we'd have more about typing and stuff like that. What we can do is a compromise. Like, I think if we did... Uh, the templates bit, uh, which is the next bit, and then we skip the admin site, which I can let you guys find out for yourselves. If you already use Django, you know how to configure the admin site. And so we'll finish with templates so that we're clear on how to change a, make, make a view return a template. Uh, and then we'll skip ahead to getting that template to render some objects that we've already put in our database. 
And the bit that we're going to skip is setting up Django's database. Bit of a shame, um, but it'll do. All right. Are you guys all ready to restart? OK. Have you been pair programming and swapping? If you didn't swap during the last bit, this is a good time to swap the person that's typing at the computer. Mm -hmm. All right. Ready to go? No, that was underwhelming then. Ready to go? Yeah! Yeah. All right. Da -da -da. <laughs> okay, so we're about here, part four. All right, so we, in our functional test, um, which incidentally should now pass, has anyone tried that? Um, our functional test, which is what's driving all of this development, um, is saying, oh well, uh, where am I here? Didn't do that, naughty me. What happens when we run the functional test, everyone? Does it work? It passes. So we actually got our functional test, which was just saying, oh, I want polls in the title, um, uh, to pass. So we now need to extend that. Like, If we want to do some more coding, if we want to extend our website, we start by extending our functional test, then we do unit test, then we do code. That's how it always works. Um, hmm? Ah, you guys, I forgot the self.fail. Thank you very much. Where is my little functional test? Maybe I haven't been doing it right. Oh, yeah, there you go. Self.fail. Finish me. Now let's try it. Okay, finish me. <laughs> All right, so let's do just that. Um, in our handout, uh, so you guys can, uh, if you find the handout in there, you can cheat a little bit and we'll do a bit of copy and pasting and I'll just explain what all of these bits do. Okay, so we're now extending the test, so it's not just that. We can say test home page lists polls. All right. <laughs> okay, so we had this stuff before. The first thing we're going to do is uh, self.browser.findElement by tag name. So, so far, the only bit of Selenium that we've used is browser.get, which fetches a web page, and browser.title, which is what is the title of the browser. That's the bit at the top. Um, now let's go and sort of start use Selenium to make assertions about what the content of the web page is. Um, and I'm going to say, all right, uh, let's say we've started building the content of the web page, and it should probably have like a header that says something like, these are the current polls. Um, so, uh, Selenium has several methods called find element or find elements by and then x. By tag name, that's an HTML tag, so it says find me the h1 on the page. Um, you can probably guess that if I typed find elements by tag name, it would give you a list of all those tags. Um, and so the self.browser is a web driver, which represents your Firefox, um, and this find element by uh, tag name is going to return a, 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 an element. A uh, thing called a web element, which is like a, uh, an element of the HTML on your page. And that has certain attributes, such as its text. Um, so we're going to say, all right, find the H1 and assert that its text says current polls. <laughs> uh, and then the next thing we're going to say is, all right, self.browser.find element by link text. Now that's a really useful one, uh, which says, find me a hyperlink on the page that has the following text. Um, uh, basically, whoops. That's going to assume that uh, we're going to have our polls are listed on the, on the page. Each one is clickable, and so she clicks on a poll whose title is How Awesome is TDD? So we can get browser, find an element text, gives us the element, and then dot click tells Selenium to, as if it was moving the mouse, click on that element, see what happens next. So that's how far. Have you guys typed all that in? Nothing. There's not a lot of typing going on. Did you guys all copy and paste instead of typing it in manually? That's naughty because if you were to type this in a little bit like... Um, Zest says you should do in Learn Python the Hard Way, you would almost definitely get a find element and a find elements wrong. You would make some spelling mistakes, and then you would learn how to spell it correctly. Um, you don't learn things except through failing and then succeeding. So let's try that. Right. <laughs> that looks good.
Do, do, do. So I pause there. That's my implicitly wait. It waited three seconds before saying, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. unable to locate element, method finding the tag name, selector h1. So I was trying to find an h1 on the page, and it said I couldn't find one. It waited three seconds just to make sure the page wasn't loading or something, and then eventually said, Harry, mate, you've asked me for an h1, there isn't one, and that's our expected failure. Basically, our current HTML for the, the, the polls main page just has HTML title, HTML, so it doesn't have any body content or anything like that. Um, so has everyone got that little expected failure? Unable to locate element. Has anyone got something that looks different to this? Everyone's got this? Hands up who, has, ha, ha, who, hmm. hands up who hasn't got this. Come on. All right. What's going on? Okay. So in the repository, you'll find... Uh, All right, for anyone who wants to cheat and do the copy and paste, it's at about line 584 of the uh, ASCII doc handout uh, file. Okay. Do, do, do. Okay. So what we're now saying is there is no H1 on the page. We want to return one. Um, in order to do that, we'd start editing probably the... Um, the HTML string. Let's go and have a look at our view. So one way of fixing this test, of getting it to pass, would be to add more stuff to this. Well, strictly speaking, I would probably add more stuff to the unit test and say, oh, okay, well, assert in h1, blah, 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 should be in that text. But we don't, I'll be right with you, we don't want to do that. Like writing HTML as long strings in Python isn't a great way of building up HTML. It'd be much better if we had a file called homepage.html um, that actually syntax highlighted nicely as HTML and told us when we were breaking things, and we could just render that back. And Django gives us a way of using that. It's called templates, and that's what we're going to do next. Um, question? Yes. Uh, okay, so. In the, in, and so it says, ask me about don't test constants. Like, there's not really much point in a test. If you have a bit of code that says wibble equals three, right, there's not much point in a unit test that says assert wibble equals three, um, because that is just kind of silly. Uh, what you really want to test is logic or functionality or, yeah, logic really. So you want to test that you've got a for loop that's written correctly, that you've got an if statement in the right place, that you've, I don't know, interpolated some list correctly. There's no point in asserting that 3 equals 3 sort of thing. Um, and so, like, asserting that a long string is the same as a long string is not much good. Um, so we want to get away from that. Uh, and do, using templates is one way. Like, another way would be if we defined a constant in the views.py called myHTML, we could go call the view function and assert the views.response was the constant myHTML. Um, but instead of that, we're going to use templates. Um, and so, really what this is about is refactoring. We want our template um, to do exactly the same as what the current uh, view returns. Um, so, uh, uh, who knows about refactoring? Or does anybody know what refactoring is? Okay. So, just for those who don't, um, refactoring is its own sort of special discipline. And what it's basically saying is there are two kinds of changes you can make to your code. Um, the first kind of change is where you make your application do new things. Um, and the second kind of thing, the change, is a refactor, where you keep your application doing the same thing it did before, but it does it in a different way, usually in a tidier way, in a cleaner way, in a way that's more understandable to you, the programmer. But from the point of view of the functionality, it should stay exactly the same. You get in a lot of trouble when you try and mix these two things together. And one of the great things about TDD is it can really help you do refactoring, because the most important thing about refactoring is you want your application to keep doing the same thing before and after you finish your refactoring, and tests are what's going to make sure that happens. So what we want to do is refactor our view to use templates, but it should still pass all exactly the same unit tests. 
So before any refactoring, you should be able to go, I can run some tests and make sure they pass. So python manage.py test. Oop, uh, polls. Okay. So I can run that test, and at any point during my refactoring, I can keep going back and checking, now, have I broken anything? And this is one of the really powerful things about TDD. Um, Ken Beck, again, uh, puts it like this. He says, um, uh, programming is a little bit like uh, trying to lift a bucket of water out of a well. Um, and the thing about lifting, if it's like a smallish bucket and it's not very full and the well's not very deep, then you can just get a bucket, tie it on a rope, chuck it down the well, and pull it out, right, and you're fine. And that's like programming. When you've got a simple problem, you can just go ahead and do it. You're smart. You can keep it all in your head. You can probably guess it right, and you can probably get it right. Um, but if you've got a much deeper well, and the rope is much longer, and the bucket is really full and heavy, then after a while, you're going to get tired. And what you really want is to be able to pop that rope through a little mechanism with a ratchet in it, so you can pull it and go click, 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 click. And whenever you get tired, you can just stop and take a break, and the ratchet is going to save your progress and make sure you don't slip backwards. All right? And that is what tests are all about. They're about saying, OK, you as a programmer can do great work, but you, know, you can only sprint for so long. After a while, you're going to need a break. And you need a way of making sure that you never go backwards. And that's what testing really gives us. Uh, and so refactoring is a great example of that. You know, whew, I've got my bucket this far. I know it's going to the right HTML. And now I can do a bit of fiddling around to make it a bit neater and tidier without ever feeling like I'm worried that I'm going to fall backwards. So let's have a look at our views.py. So at the moment it does this. Um, let's make a template then that's going to have this sort of HTML string in it. Uh, so we'll copy this. And we make a new file uh, called home.html. Now templates in Django live inside your apps. And they live in a special folder called templates. So we'll need to make that first. McDeer, polls, templates. And then, so I've got my templates. I'm going to start a new file in here. My site, polls, templates, home.html. OK. And paste. And you can see that now that this file is called home.html, I get syntax highlighting. So my editor is now helping me to write correct HTML. This is way better than trying to concatenate strings in Python. Um, so I've got my home.html. Hooray! Let's try running the test again. Well, they still pass, but we actually haven't actually changed anything yet. We've just made a new file. So good. We've made a new file, and it hasn't broken anything. The tests have told us that. That's a good thing. And the next thing we want to do is, now that we've got home.html as a sort of file separately from that, we want to be able to render that instead of creating an HTTP response from scratch. So Django has a little shortcut function that helps us to do that. From Django.shortcuts... No, not with capital S. Import render. <laughs> and so instead of returning a raw HTTP response of a string like this, we can return render. The first argument to the render function is the request from the user for reasons that we can go into in the future. And the second argument is what is the name of the template you want to render. So there you go. And we don't need that import anymore. So let's try that. So that's saying to Django, OK, instead of returning a, a, a HTTP response for the string that we've created ourselves, grab me this home.html template and return that instead. And what we get is an actual failure. False is not true at line 18 in our tests. So like our refactoring has broken something. Let's go and take a closer look. That's saying response.content.ends with HTML is not true. So that's a little weird. Um, like, certainly in my home.html, that does end with... Oh, well, actually, it doesn't. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. So my unit tests have actually helped me right there. Um, but it's still going to fail. So what's going on there? Well, sometimes when your tests fail and you're not quite sure why, you might want to do a little debug um, statement. So you might want to do something like, OK, well, let's print um, the response.content at this point. So when your unit test misbehaves, you'll often find yourself putting a little print statement just before the point at which it fails to go and check what's going on. Let's try that. Zip. OK, well, that looks like it ends in HTML. What could be going on? Let's try something different. Instead of presenting it, let's print the repra, 
which is the string representation. Uh, not reprit. You guys know about repra? So in Python, when you print a string, it just prints it as if uh, uh, what it would look like. The repra is the internal representation of the string, which is going to include all the white space characters, like tabs and backends for carriage returns and things like that. So let's try that again. So the actual string we've got is HTML, then a new line, then some spaces, title, poll, all the things, then a new line, then HTML, and then another new line at the end. That's what's making our test fail. So basically, we've got a tiny little new line at the end, um, and our unit tests are complaining about that. That's a trivial little thing. We can authorize ourselves to fix that. Um, the way I'm going to fix it is by doing a strip. Because basically, white space at the end of an HTML file doesn't matter, so that test is functionally equivalent to the one I had before. Does that make sense? And now we pass. So that was a little refactoring there. I've changed from returning a raw string to returning something based on a template, and the unit tests were able to tell me that I'd done it correctly, that I hadn't broken anything. So like, if, for example, while I was um, copying my home.html, I'd somehow made a mistake and forgot to, say, close the title tag, right? That's an easy mistake to make when you're sort of copy and pasting or moving things around. My test would help me by saying, hang on a minute, you haven't quite got that right. So the idea of unit testing really is to save you from having to be smart all the time, and you can save your being really smart for really hard problems, and then really trivial things like not forgetting slashes in raw HTML, you've got a little helper for you there. Fantastic. Has everyone managed to get that done, the uh, render and the home.html? So once we've got that, you might do a commit. The next thing we want to do is, like we were talking earlier about don't test constants, at the moment we're still making assertions about raw strings. I think it'd be better if our unit test just really tested, like, so, you know, raw HTML, we want to be able to make changes to this without having to change a unit test every time. If I want to, like, indent something or add a paragraph or change the CSS or, or, or um, uh, you know, like, uh, add an extra H1 or a fewer one, things that are, like, just visual presentation, I don't need my unit test failing every time. So it'd be nicer if our test just tested the functionality of that view, which is, this view should render this template. So let's make our test say, does this view render this template? So that's now refactoring the test, just like we refactored the code. <laughs> so we can go from Django. Now remind me, where does this belong? There it is. Uh, 582, down here. Okay, here we are. All right, so instead of making a bunch of assertions over here about what exactly the strings of my HTML are, let's just find the actual template ourselves manually and say expected response equals render to string. So we saw the render function there will prepare an HTTP response. Um, uh, so this is expected HTML, in fact. Home.html. So in our test, we're going to say, oh, let's actually render this template ourselves in the test and make sure the view can return that too. And so instead of all these, we can go self.assert equal response.content expected HTML. Let's see if that works. Uh, Fantastic. So I've then made sure that I've got something that's equivalent, basically, to all those asserts. I've used the refactoring tool to make sure that I haven't gone backwards. And now I'm changing my test to just say, let's stop testing string constants and just assert that our view renders the correct template. And now we've got a much more sane test so we can delete all the old stuff. OK. What that means now is if when I go into my home.html and I want to make changes to it, um, I can just go ahead because this is basically just a constant. Isn't it? It's like a big long string, this file. So making changes to this shouldn't involve changing uh, my unit tests. So I can now add new stuff. Like, for example, this is actually broken HTML. This should actually be in the head. Oop. End head. <laughs> and you can see that obviously when I rerun the test, they still pass. And then finally, if I remind myself of what I'm actually trying to achieve here, and one of the great things about TDD is it also um, helps to remind you of what you're trying to do at any time. So if you ever lose track of what was I going to do next, 
I can always just go back and rerun the functional test because that's what's driving our development. So at every stage, the test should be telling us what to do next. I went back and ran the functional test and it's saying, oh yeah, I still haven't got an H1 on the home page. So I can now go and put that in. So let's put some body, H1, stuff, and body. Okay, so look at that. I've deliberately done that wrong. I've put H1 stuff instead of H1 current polls. Um, but that will let me test my test. So let's see if it works. Brrr. Fantastic. So Selena's actually found my new heading that I've put on the page there. Uh, and it's saying, well, I want it to say current polls, not stuff. And so I can finish that off in here. Jim. And that should get us as far as this. So now our functional test gets a little step further. Um, we've managed to put a new heading onto the page. We've learned how to use Selenium's find element by tag name. Um, and we've learned how to use uh, Django's templating system, which makes us much more free in how we unit test the, uh, the HTML that our views respond with. OK. Who's got that? Who needs a little help just at this point? Hands up. You're all, you're all OK with that? Oh. Du -du -du. How are you guys doing? Okay. How many people in the room have never used Django? Okay. All right, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to skip ahead a little bit. And what I want to just talk about is the uh, Django's models, because that's so critical to Django. I think it's not fair on people who've never used Django to not cover that. So I'm going to skip setting up the admin site. Uh, and what I just want to talk about for a little bit um, is creating a, uh, a model, which is what represents database objects. I'm going to talk about how we unit test those. Um, so is everyone OK with the last bit? Can we move on? If you mean no, do say no instead of yes. All right. Let's open up test.py. So the bit that we're skipping um, is we're skipping a part of the test where uh, Django has set up its admin site, uh, and the administrator is going to go and create a poll, which our normal user can later vote on. Um, so we're going to skip ahead for that uh, for now. Um, and instead, we're going to say, OK, well, from the Django database point of view, how do we create a database object? Um, so let's open up test.py. And we create a new class in here. Creating and saving a poll. OK. Uh, where was that question coming from? Yeah. Um, so where you should be uh, is, let's see. Your functional test.py should look something like this. Uh, uh, OK, yeah. So the, have you got the first two bits to find the h1 and assert current polls? All right. 
So that should be on your handout as well. Um, that's a page. About page 10, I think. Page 11. You know what? The more I think about this, the more I think it makes much more sense to just carry through this in the logical order. Because, um, yeah, there's just a missing gap here. It doesn't make any sense. All right. Um, so let's recap. So far, we've got a home page that can render some raw, raw HTML. But now what we want to be able to do is have uh, a special user of the site, like a super user, needs to be able to go in there and create a new poll. And they're like, oh, this interest week, I'm interested in polling, um, uh, I don't know, who likes TDD. Um, and the possible votes are going to be like me and definitely me. Um, so uh, one of the great things that Django does is it gives you its admin site, which is a kind of, kind of pre-prepared um, uh, site for administrators of your website to use, to uh, like super users, to create stuff like polls, um, database objects, administer what the users have done. Um, and it gives you a whole UI for doing that entirely for free. Um, so, and this is one of the main things that the Django tutorial covers, so I think it's only appropriate that we cover it here. So the, what we do test here is separately, I think, from having our, our test of a normal user, this is Elspeth, right? Elspeth is the normal user. We're going to have a different user. Um, who's got the handout? What do I call my different user? I think he's called Mo. Test administrator can create new polls. Okay, so Mo goes to the admin site. So basically you'll get a special URL on your website, usually slash admin, where an administrator can log in with a username and password, um, and they'll be able to do special things that normal users can't do. Um, so here we go, self.browser.get. So let's copy this one. Zip. Zip. And he'll go to a special URL called slash admin. All right, and then to check that the admin site is switched on and working, we can do something like this. Django admin, remind me whether this is uppercase or lowercase, administration lowercase. Self.browser.title. Okay. So we've created a new test. Now this is inside functional test.py, not test.py. Um, and we're going to say that Mo the administrator, we'll call him that. And then later on he'll say he logs in and enters a new poll. So I'll put fail, finish me. All right, so I want to get at least this little bit working. So what we're expecting is like users who go to the slash admin URL should see some kind of Django administration special page where they'll be able to enter a username and password. Let's try and run that. All right, so we get two failures. The first one is the same failure we had earlier um, because we've now got two tests. It actually uh, has two different failures. The first one is, okay, there's still no link on the home page saying how awesome is TDD. But now we've got a second test, um, and it's saying, all right, if I go to the slash admin, I'm actually finding page not found, not admin. Um, because Django doesn't have the admin automatically, you actually have to configure it. Um, so the first thing we want to do is, while we're just working on the admin, um, let's pause the other test. Uh, and so this is the bit where I said, ask me about don'tifying. All right, one of the ways you can make sure we don't run both of these tests temporarily is if I change this function name, the home page test, so if don't test the home page polls, then it's no longer a method that starts with test underscore, and so when I rerun functional test, it won't get run. Ta-da! So that's don'tifying tests. Usually if you've got two different functional tests, you just want to run one of them, put a big don't in front, or at least that's how we do it. Maybe you guys want to use something different, like never test blah 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 blah, or forget to test blah 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 blah. That's entirely up to you. There's lots of freedom. 
<laughs> okay, so has everyone got this error? Hands up who's got this? Almost no one. Okay, so I'll wait. What? We're doing part five, yes. Okay. All right. Yep. A little bit behind the room, try to check, uh, yeah. check out a specific tag. People who've used Django before, what do we do next? What? Who? Nobody's used Django before? Come on. Okay, how do we do that? Where? There are three lines. Okay. Let's go. All right. So, um, how do we enable the admin? Uh, well, the admin is like a Django app, just like the Polls app that we've built. It's one of Django's apps that they've produced for you. It's one of the ones that we can use. Um, and the way we add a new app to our project is in settings.py, just like we did earlier. Um, so that's still open over here. Settings.py. Let's have a look for the word admin. Hop, whoops, I can't tell you what, I was right there. Here. Um, so if you're looking in settings.py at installed apps, um, you'll find it's even right in there with a helpful comment saying uncomment the next line to enable the admin. Who here has ever used the admin docs? No one. What? Really? What for? <laughs> okay. Uh, Good. All right. Well, so the Django developers are glad they're not wasting their time. Great. Um, so there we go. We enable the admin. Let's see if that's worked. Nope. Still not. Um, so it is. Uh, yep. There you go. So it's still saying um, I'm not finding uh, the admin site. So usually when we have a 404 not found, it's something to do with URLs. Let's go and have a look at URLs. So in my site, my site URLs.py. Sure enough. Um, there's a little thing here about uncommenting this line to enable the admin. Okay. And then you can see straight away my little editor is giving me an error. Um, there are three lines in here that we have to uncomment. 
So the admin site is so common to Django that in its default URLs.py, it's just popped that in there for you to get ready and, and uncomment. And what that's basically saying is, as well as my URL for the front page, let's also include the admin site at slash admin. What that means is, if you want to put the admin site somewhere else, you absolutely can. If you want to put it as a, like slash secret or at, at slash super user, you can just change this little URL here and it will work just the same. Um, so that is one line uncommented in settings.py, three lines uncommented in urls.py. Let's see if that works. Improperly configured. What is that all about? Um, so at this point, we're like, okay, improperly configured. It's obviously complaining about something. Um, let's see if we can maybe rerun our unit tests and see if they'll give us a little hint about what's going on. Nope, they're fine. So when um, you get an error like this, and it's a little bit opaque, um, you're like, well, that's not actually that helpful, is it? Django Administrator is not found in improperly configured. Um, one of the good things to do is put a little time.sleep so that instead of Selenium just rushing through all its stuff, we can actually stop it at one point and go and take a look at what uh, the web browser is actually showing us. Um, so let's try that. In functional test.py, Okay, before we do our assert, let's do import time, time.sleep, 10. So we're just going to pause for 10 seconds at that point. So that means now when I rerun it, uh, no, not that one. Okay. The little browser is going to pause and it's going to show us that. That's actually pretty helpful. Um, so, uh, we can actually get our um, functional test to print that out for us even better. So, like the page of the website there um, is telling us what to do. So, let's make our functional test actually make assertions about the page as well as the browser.title. So, if I do um, body equals self.browser.find element by tag name body, and we'll do, instead of checking on the browser title, body.text. Ship. And we've still got our time.sleep. Okay. Uh, and if you're able to see that, the top of that would now show you, okay, um, because Django is configured in debug mode, when things are a little bit broken, it's going to show you a web page saying, okay, I'm broken for the following reason. It's trying to help you, the developer, to get things uh, set up correctly. So um, what that little debug page is telling us is, um, in order to get the admin site, ah, too late, admin site configured, we need to set up a database name. Um, so if we go into settings.py, um, find the databases section, and all we need to do is give the database a name. So this is actually the first time where we really need to have a database in our application. Because the admin site needs usernames and passwords, and Django assumes you're going to store those usernames and passwords in some kind of database, it's saying, look, um, you can't start the admin without having some kind of database. You've chosen SQLite. A SQLite database needs a name, which is actually going to be the name of a file on a drive. Um, so please continue filling in the settings in settings.py properly. Uh, so that's what I've added there. Name is db.sqlite. And let's try it again. This time we get a slightly different error. It's annoying that this doesn't show it on screen, but you guys who are running this yourselves, you should be able to see that at the top of this traceback, um, you can actually read the Django debug error message. And it's now a slightly different error. Let's see if I can move this along slightly. Hoop, hoop. OK, no such table Django session. So it's saying, OK, great, you've given me a database. Um, but now it's not configured properly, this database yet. And so that's telling us that we need to run one more Django command to get our database set up, um, which is the famous syncdb command. So because Django is designed to manage your database for you, um, it can actually create your database and create all the tables within it um, so that you can define them in Django rather than having to write your own SQL. Um, and so at the moment it's saying, look, you haven't even set up your database yet. Uh, you need to do that for me before I can show you the admin site. And the command to do that is, again, a manage.py Swiss Army Knife command. SyncDB. Okay. So see at that point it's going, okay, 
SingDB, I know you wanted the admin site. Um, and if you want the admin site, then you probably need some kind of super user. Do you want to create a super user now? Yes or no? I'm going to hit yes. I'm going to have his username is admin. His email address is going to be a at b dot com. Yeah. Oh, he's moved. That's why. How did that happen? Yeah. Is that better? All right. The password I'm going to use is the super secret ADM1N. ADM1N. Bang. Ta-da. All right. And let's try the functional test again. Finish me. OK, so it's perfectly happy. Um, now, does that all seem a little bit too much like magic? It does feel a bit like magic, doesn't it? You've got like a thing popping up over here, and the admin, and the settings, and the database. And the so whenever you know, things seem a little bit like magic, you can always go and visit your website manually. So just open up a normal web browser. Here's mine that I prepared earlier. And you can always just go and visit localhost 8000. Sure enough, that's my home page. And slash admin. Admin. OK. So I'm going to let you go so you can try it out. So I um, set up the username and password admin and adm1n. So let's try logging in. Yeah, and there you go. There's our site administration. So the next part of the tutorial would then take us through, let's add polls to this menu so that an administrator can create a poll all via this UI. Isn't it nice? Like Django gives you all this stuff for free, all these nice little blue shaded bars. You don't have to write that. It's all just there. Whatever your application has in terms of database models and objects and whatever, administrators can just go in there and create them and adjust them and add permissions to them and whatever else you might say. And you don't have to code any of that boilerplate stuff. It's wonderful. And it has a nice blue shading. And you can change the blue shading to a different color if you want to by customizing its CSS. And you get a pony. Um, so uh, I'm going to let you guys all um, see if you can manage to get the admin site set up uh, just like that. Um, we're in part five. And make sure you can navigate to it manually as well and try logging in um, and like reassuring yourself that it works. And then we're going to skip the next bit where we get the administrator to sort of log in and do stuff, because that's stuff you can do all do in your own time. Da -da -da. So the functional test should be saying, finish me, uh, and the admin site should be appearing on your web browser. Who has not got that? Oh no, this is some evil problem with the sites framework. Um, which version of Django are you running? Should be one for it. Import Django, yeah. Django dot um, think dot version in capital. Oh no, you found it. <coughs> Hang on, let the tab completion help you.
Okay, good. Um, so uh, at this point, I think we should probably skip ahead. Um, and I'm going to let you guys do a checkout of a bit from my repo um, that will let you uh, sort of skip ahead and have a bunch of work that we would have otherwise done in parts 6, 7, 8, and 9, I think, um, just done. Uh, in your own time, you can go back to this tutorial, follow through the handout, and just make sure you understand all the intervening steps. Uh, my tutorial is online. Soon there'll be a book. You can ask me all these questions by email, so I'm absolutely there. Uh, yeah? Hmm? Oh, um, so that should be in there somewhere. Yeah, that sounds right. Selenium.webdriver.com and .keys. Um, you can find that at page... I mean, I don't know when we're using key. I haven't actually asked anyone to use keys so far, so you guys must be ahead. Uh, yeah? Um, I, I think it's on page 19 in the handout. Okay. So, um, if you've got as far as I have, you should be in this sort of state. Um, So if you do a git status uh, at this point in the repo, um, you should see that you've got a new folder in red called my site. Oh, actually, yeah, you can't see that because I've skipped to the wrong window. Okay. Okay, I'm just showing you guys this. So git status should say something like this. Um, probably not the uh, PDF or the handout, but you'll have a my site in red. That's saying you've done a bunch of work in a folder called my site that I don't know about. Um, and what I'm now going to say is, now my repository also has a folder called my site and we're going to check out some stuff from it to overwrite um, the things that we've got in my site. So if you want to save your work to come back to it later, you can do a git stash. Okay. Uh, and so now we can... And so that should save all your stuff, and then later on you can do a git stash pop to get it back. Um, and where are we? Part 8, 9, 10, 11, 12... I'm not typing anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to skip to part 10. All right, so in your handouts, Okay, so you have to be a bit careful about this. So, I'm currently in the top level of the tree. I'm not inside the my site folder. I'm just at the top level, right? So in here, I should have my site and stuff like that. And the command I want to run is git checkout pycon 2013 part 10 dash dash my site. Are we ready? This is quite a destructive thing to do. So it's going to blow away a lot of stuff. Let's give it a go. Ta -da! What you should find, is that's now going to give you all of these little files here. Um, so uh, once you've done that checkout, you can check that it's worked in the following way. In my site, there'll be a new templates folder with a 500.html. In polls, you're going to have a new fixtures folder with an admin user.json. Uh, and yeah, those are the two most obvious ones. And a polls admin.py, yeah. Oh, uh, you probably can't if you've got a Mac. Sorry. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah. So just navigate to it in your normal browser. Uh, tree. It's not on Macs. You could try brew install tree. Yeah, brew install tree might do it. Macs. Ah, it is in your handouts, part 10. Uh, that's page number 27. Okay. Who knows what time we're due to end? 12? 12? <laughs> okay. 12.20. Uh, okay, fine. And when do we do feedback forms? Uh, yeah, there's no person official enough. Okay, well, um, so maybe at about 12.15 or something, we'll just mention that. Mm -hmm. 
OK. So um, as soon as you've managed to get um, the Git checkout to work, and you've checked that it works by having templates 500 HTML um, and the uh, new fixtures admin JSON, we can actually run our FTs. And the command to run our FTs has changed slightly. Manage.py, oh, that's CD in my site. You'll see there's a new FTs folder, an FTs app, which is where I've moved functional test.py now lives in its own app. And I can run it as a Django test like this. Do -lo 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 -lo. And you should see that does loads of stuff like this. OK. And what you should find is that your functional test, Python manage.test FTs, will run two tests, one of which will pass, and the other one of which is going to give us the same error that we had earlier. So that's the stuff. We've all skipped ahead of setting up the admin site and setting up the polls model. That's all done. And we're back to wanting to list our polls on uh, the main view. So this is the stuff that you should be getting to. Um, being able to go Python manage.py test FTs, um, and it should give uh, this sort of unable to locate element. So that is the very top of the part 10. In your handouts, part 10 tells you what to do in terms of the get checkout, what command to run, Python manage.py test FTs, and what the expected failure is no such element exception. Um, so if you haven't got that, um, please ask for help now. Uh, OK, so you'll need to quit. Oh, that's a good question. If you get an error saying address already in use, um, you should quit your development server. So you're running your development server in another console somewhere. Um, just quit that, because the new way we've got set up that we've all skipped past will run the development server for you. Yeah. Uh, then you probably haven't quit it properly.
Okay, so what have we skipped there in all that magic? Um, we've skipped actually creating uh, a database model for the polls. Um, and that's something you can easily follow along through the, um, the normal Django tutorial will teach you about that. And if you have a look through this handout after that, you'll see the way that I'm unit testing it, which I think is in part six, um, should make a lot of sense. So that's something you can do in your own time. Um, and we've also converted the functional test.py uh, into being an app of its own. So just like we've got an app for our polls, um, we've got an app for FTs. So somebody asked a question earlier about what's the best way of organizing my functional tests when I've got loads and loads of different Django apps. Um, and the way I do it, or I, I do it in this tutorial, is I make a special app called FTs, which stands for functional tests, um, which does all of the functional testing for all the other apps. Uh, and the reason for that is I tend to find that um, from the user's point, the user doesn't care what apps you have, right? They just care about what they can do on the site. And a particular piece of functionality might be delivered by several apps working together. Um, so for that reason, I think functional tests are kind of a cross-cutting concern, and so that's why I keep them separate from the app structure. But, you know, you might find different things work for you in different ways. Um, so that's why that's working. We're also using a special Django class called the Live Server Test Case. So right up until now, we've always been running the Django dev server in one console, and running the FTs against it in another one. Live server test case will start up a server for you, and it also creates a sort of brand new, fresh database. Um, and so that there are issues about how you, know, you want your real database and your testing database to be separate, and live server test case solves those problems for you. Um, so again, that's stuff that you can read about on my uh, tutorial website or in my forthcoming book, um, where it'll explain it a little bit more logically. Um, but for now, in part 10, we've now got a poll object. We know how to create it through the admin site. So if you have a look in uh, ft slash tests.py, um, 
you'll see that there's a bunch of code in there that basically lets the administrator log into the admin site and create a poll, and a poll will have now choices, and it has a publication date and all those things. Um, and so now our normal user, like so the, the FT now works where the administrator goes in, creates a couple of polls with different choices, and now we want our normal user to be able to log in and see those polls and click on them. Um, so that's the stage that we're at now. Um, so uh, does that all make sense? Any questions at this stage? There was one at the front. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the FT is great. Any other questions? Do, do, do. Okay. And so if you all managed to go Python manage.py test FTs and you've got this failure here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the next stage is okay, we've got a way of making polls. We've got a way for the administrator to create them. We now want our website to display all those polls as a list on our home page. So let's go and have a look around our code here. Um, so a load file, but uh, go and have a look at home.html. Where's it gone here? Load. All right. So this is my home HTML page. And basically, what I want to say is, I want to somehow list all the polls on this HTML page. Um, so then let's go and have a look at the tests for our views. And so that is polls slash tests. Here he is. Load. Um, and you'll see that this poll slash test has grown a bunch of new tests. The poll model test is the test that we've set up a, uh, a model for the polls correctly. Um, and you can see it does things like create a poll, assert you can save it to the database and retrieve it. Um, so that's all stuff that you can take a look through in your own time. Um, there are choices that relate to polls. And here's back our old homepage test, just the way we left it. And what we want to say now is like our homepage is not just a static page. We want our homepage to actually show us whatever polls we have in the database. So the way we're going to adjust this test is we're going to say, all right, let's set up the test so that there are a couple of polls, and then let's assert that the template is showing those polls um, in there. So before we even start, we can create a couple of polls. So let's do that. So we're editing my site polls test.py, polls test.py, not ft's test.py. OK? So create some polls. And let's have poll one. OK, we have a poll like that, poll1.question equals, ooh, um, what should we have as our first poll? Like, uh, who loves TD? Oop. And it needs a publication date as well. And to get into that, we use timezone.now. All right, and let's create two of them just to make sure that it can render more than one. So you control R because I'm using screen. That's why control A doesn't work. That's been bugging me all day. OK, chink, chink. Poll two. So the second poll is like, uh, changing brackets. Let's have life, the universe, everything. OK, and that can be for now as well. Time zone now is just a little thing. Uh, Django's latest version really insists that you use time zones when you're entering dates and stuff in the database. Um, and so that little time zone function will just go, OK, well, what's the local time zone? Let's do it. Um, do, do, do. Uh, and so, and then in a similar way, we leave all the rest just like it was. We get our response. We check that the uh, template renders correctly. And then the other, the final thing we want to do is like, so when you're editing a template and you're just tweaking little things like, you know, changing a paragraph or changing a bit of layout or adding some help text, you don't want to change your unit tests every time for that. But when your templates start to have a bit of logic in them, when the templates want to iterate through a list or have an if in them, um, I suggest that you can actually unit test that. So we're going to say, let's check that, um, that uh, the two polls are actually in our um, response. So the poll1.question should be in the response.content. Dot, dot and same for poll two. So does that make sense so far? We create a couple of polls, and then we're going to say, all right, now I want to make sure that my home page lists those polls. So that's what I've done here. And let's try and run that. OK. Uh, what page of the handout is this on, by the way, for people who are copying it out? I think that's on page. 27, right? Okay, let's try and run it. 
So we run the unit test, which is Python manage.py test polls. And that's going to say, all right, well, look, currently in your template, you're not listing the polls. And this is the bit where we learn a little bit of Django template magic. Because the whole point of Django templates is they're not just static HTML. You can also do clever things with them, like iterate through uh, some stuff from your database and display it in your template. So this is the bit where we get a little bit like PHP, but not evil. OK, so there's special syntax. So far, home.html has just been HTML. And now we start using some of Django's special template syntax. And what I was going to say is, when you, call, when you render a template in Django, you can also tell it to use certain objects, uh, certain Python objects, and insert them into your template using this special syntax. And you can even use things like for loops. And the syntax uh, for for loops is a special, completely impossible to type combination of curly brackets percent. So just everyone practice that for a little bit. Uh, pinky left hand, pinky right hand, and then pinky right hand, middle finger over to the five, which is impossible to find. I don't know why, why they did it, honestly. So let's go for poll in, and we're expecting the current polls to be in there. And you'll see the syntax is a little bit like um, Python, and for, um, except the indentation doesn't matter. So we've got a little for loop there. And so that means that inside this little block here, we've got access to poll as a variable. And if we want to print it, we can do so like this, poll.question. So that's going to say our template has got access to the poll objects and can print them like that. Poll in current polls, print poll.question. And so there's two slightly different syntaxes there. The curly bracket percent impossible to type is for logical blocks, which tends to be things like for loops and ifs. And the curly curly tends to be just show me the text of a particular Python object. Um, and then the template syntax is, is intelligent, so if it can't find that attribute, it just prints the empty string, and it's very forgiving in terms of, uh, of cockups. <laughs> yes. I don't know, what do you mean by that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, JavaScript. Well, uh, in my forthcoming book, which I'm going to plug maybe six or seven more times, but no more than that, right? I'm going to talk all about how um, the fact that you're using Selenium lets you write functional tests for JavaScript. And I'm also going to talk about unit testing JavaScript, which is a world of pain. Um, but since we've all at work been through that world of pain, I can try and share with you some of the ways of doing that with less pain. So that's going to be like chapter, I don't know, say 11 of my book, which has currently got four chapters. And it will be on the O'Reilly Early Release program sometime this week. Um, so check it out. And it will be free. I mean. It will be released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, um, uh, no derivatives uh, license, which means that you are free to download it. But since it's a book about programming and you're all programming professionals, that is, strictly speaking, commercial usage. So if you like it, you should pay. All right? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, I'm going to have my cake and eat it. All right? <laughs> um, so let's try running the FTs against that now. OK, so that's still not happening. Um, we put them into the template, but the like, missing piece of the puzzle is like the template is now expecting us to have some current polls. How do we actually give them to the template? Back in our views.py, um, we need to actually pass in any poll objects to the template. And similarly, um, in the unit test. So let's try that over here. Dip, 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 dip. And so the way we type in. Um, what it's called is when you're rendering a template, the, syntax, the, the uh, terminology Django uses, a template, uh, rendering a template happens in a context. And the context is a dictionary of variable names to Python variables that you want the template to be able to access. So here we wanted um, a current polls. So we're going to get it. Ah. Um, so context equals nothing is my fault. It's all my fault. Let's put it on multiple lines so we can read that a little bit. And let's just say that we want to have all the poll objects. Oh, 
Okay. So basically, we've got a pole model, uh, and that pole model also gives us a little uh, Django-y way of retrieving all the poles from the database. That's poles.objects.all. And we're going to say we want all of the poles to be available to the template as a variable called current poles. And maybe that will make sense if I do a little split. B, home, ha ha. So now you can see how our view at the bottom is going to pass in those poles, and the template at the top is going to iterate through all those poles and type in their question. Da, da, da. And so we can run the test again. Do, 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 do. Okay, so it wasn't context. Sure, it was context. Fine. That should work. Let's put them in a little list like this. Ah, okay. Who's figured out what mistake I've been making all this time? Like, you guys haven't copied me. I forgot to save these pole objects up here. Deliberate mistake. There you go. So you should now get an error a little bit like this, which is saying that the expected content isn't right anymore, so the expected HTML isn't right anymore. So we just need to adjust our tests, because they're now slightly out of date, to the fact that, uh, let's say control jam, BD, okay. So basically our expected HTML is also going to need the context in here as well. So we're going to current. Okay, so going through that step by step, we've added our two little assertions that say, okay, these questions should be in there. And we now also need to say that when we, when we go and say, okay, we're rendering the expected HTML, just like we do it in the real thing in our test as well, we need to say, oh, okay, the poles need to be passed into our render functions as uh, current poles. Da, da, da. So the render to string and the render argument are very similar. Um, and if you notice, the only difference really is I'm using these two as just a straight list. Um, whereas in the view, I'm using a little query on the database. Where is my views? Hmm? Yeah. I made a what? What have I done? Thank you very much. Look at that, you guys really are paying attention. That's great. Thank you. So we can try that. And that passes. Okay. So you've seen we've moved there from having a template which was just blank HTML 
to having a template that actually has a context. We pass in some Python objects, in this case, uh, poll objects, and we can actually process them in the template using a little special for loop. Question? Yeah. Um, so what kind of problem in the template? So, yes, absolutely. So that's why I've kind of got, I've got the best of both worlds here. So I've started by saying, all right, if I break my template, yeah, this test will break. And so that's why I've got a couple of little sanity checks, just saying, um, as well as just rendering the template, which tests that my view is using the right template, I've also got these tests down here, which are testing the functionality of the template. So I'm saying the template, at the very least, should have the two poles in. And so basically, the way I think of this is, um, Anything that's like HTML, uh, which is kind of, uh, I guess you'd say display or presentation layer stuff, where it's not too important for the functionality of the site, you don't need to have unit tests for that. But when you've got a template that has a for loop or an if or anything that's a little bit complicated and a bit like code, you should be looking to have a unit test for that. So that's the two sides for it. This is where I just test a constant, and this is, or this is where I test that like, it's the right template, and this is where I test that the template itself is working, that the logic of my template works. Because now the templates are not just raw text, um, they need a bit of unit testing. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you could add a bit more stuff to this. For example, if you wanted to check that your templates were always valid HTML, you could import some HTML library that test, uh, tested validity. And you could have a few unit tests that test that the templates are actually valid HTML, for example. Um, but your functional test should save you from most of the presentational stuff. So if you make a big cock up in your template, the page will be broken, and Selenium will say this page doesn't make any sense. So it's about trying to split the responsibilities where, they, where they're sensible. <laughs> OK. All right. So has everyone got that far, as far as a passing unit test at that point? What you'll find if you rerun the functional tests is that they still don't pass. Here they go. Those are our two bulleted lists, but neither of them are a hyperlink yet. So the functional test is still failing, saying you haven't really got a hyperlink here. Um, so we can fix that in home.html. Let's make these guys into hyperlinks. Fantastic. And so that's going to get a little bit further. It's going to say, now I've made those hyperlinks do nothing. So the next stage in the test is saying, all right, when I click on that link, I expect to then be able to vote. And I expect to be taken to a new page. But it's not actually taking it to a new page. So it's saying, oh, well, the new page that should say there are no votes yet is actually the old page, current polls. How awesome is TDD? So our next stage is to create a new URL for an individual poll object and have that display its choices and have radio buttons and clickable form submissions and stuff like that. OK. So this is where you should be getting to. Who's got to this? OK. All right. So that means everybody else needs a little help, needs a bit of time to catch up. All right, let's start these guys. How are you guys doing here? Yep, that looks about right. OK, so what have you got? Um, ba -ba -dum, that looks good. Poll 1, poll 2, poll 1 looks saved. Yep, that looks good. Poll 2 looks saved. Good, 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 good. So that's a bit hard to read, isn't it? So I think the next stage, maybe in here, to get using that, instead of having Hmm. Okay. 
Yeah. All right, you doing fine? How are you guys doing over here? <laughs> okay, so you put up that. How about the unit? Okay. So you can you can call like all these Am I on your seat? Okay, so um, now do a Git checkout. Python is on the Yeah. Okay, we do a Git dash on space.
then if you want to cheat and copy and paste, if you open up the Python I have never even seen this, I've only seen this end of it. Oh, it's coming on back. There is no link for... And then the other thing is, you want to be running these. That's the console part. The unit test. Hold now happens, and so um, your next thing is to say, Yeah, 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 I can do it. Um, okay, cool. So the unit test now passes that way. But the function test is still saying there's no time frame. So then over here, you can turn this into the space of the script. So I'm just wrapping it in a few minutes. Basically, where is it? Yeah, like this stage. So you can wrap it. You are the whole list you are for now. I don't know the outside of the whole list. Get it to the <laughs> Okay, guys, that's us basically five minutes from the end. So um, I I've been required to tell you about the feedback link. I would love to hear your feedback. Please put it in through that link. Um, my email address is on uh, all of those forms. So you can email me if you don't want to tell me face-to-face. -face, or come and tell me face-to-face. -face. Please tell me what you liked about it. And especially tell me what you would uh, like to change about this workshop, how you think I could do it better. Um, come and ask me questions about TDD in general. Uh, I'm going to be around now. I'm going to be around during lunch. And I'm going to be around all weekend. So please do just come and grab me um, if you have any questions about TDD in your own lives um, and uh, um, yeah 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 of course yeah buy my book I mean read it for free first and then buy it um, and is that it okay so yeah I'll let you guys finish up whatever you want to do here if you want I'm gonna walk around if you want to get through to the end of part 10 I'm happy to do that with you guys um, but otherwise uh, that's me done so I hope you enjoyed it thank you very much